lecture. I want to, I want to start uh, making a couple of announcements. First of all, the title of the talk has been uh, changed. We sort of had a mix up with uh, titles. We had it up there. It will be uh, Knots and Tangles is um, the title of the talk. And I also want to say a little bit about uh, Joe Parsons before we start. The, the lecture is in honor of Joe Parsons, and um, I want to say a little bit about, about Joe. Joe was, um, was a, the first member of the math department at UNCA. Um, Joe was, was born in Tennessee and um, went to college at the University of Tennessee, went to grad school there, and um, started at at the Asheville Biltmore College in 1952 as the sole member of the math department. Um, that was what later turned into UNCA. Um, he was known for his sense of humor in class and still known for his sense of humor. Um, he was an academic dean at one point and uh, dean of students and um, the chair of the math department in the 70s. I guess when you're the sole member of the math department, that makes you the chair of the math department. Um, he, uh, he helped design the campus when the campus moved up to the, up to the hill here. Um, he helped design that and was actually, uh, I have a quote that he wanted the library to face the mountains. And I think, so when you stand on the library steps and you see Mount Pisgah out there, that was what Joe, that was Joe's vision of the campus. Um, he helped develop the first four-year curriculum here on campus. Um, that does include the humanities, which can't, for some of us that's exciting. For some of us that's uh, um, that's a great thing. It's a great program. <laughs> um, um, later, after Joe had retired, he. Uh, he donated money to the math department, which is now in scholarship, which we give out in scholarships um, to students in the math department. And later, a, um, a student of Joe's donated money, which is now being used to run this, um, the Parsons Lecture. Um, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that so that I could just let the students know that this is a possibility um, in years to come when you become rich famous mathematicians. Um, you can donate all that big money you make with mathematics to the, to the department. Um, so I wanted to just thank Joe, who is here in um, the fourth, fifth row down there, and, and thank Joe for, for all that he's done for the campus. I think his vision of the campus and of the department um, really has, has come to fruition. Um, so I I'd like to thank Joe. Joe? <laughs> I, I have one more announcement. Afterwards, there's going to be a, um, a small reception. I wonder how we'll all fit in there. Um, there's going to be a reception afterwards in the glass house. Um, uh, so everybody is in, invited to that. Um, um, now I'll introduce um, Dr. Sam Kaplan, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks again for coming out tonight. And um, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce John Conway, who holds the von Neumann chair at uh, Princeton University. Prior to that, um, he was at Cambridge. I think the story that I've heard, I mean, you hear all these things as graduate students that are just myths, you know, that come from dusty time or something like that, but this one wasn't that old, right? Um, that uh, John Conway, when I think he was 11, is that true, something like that, was interviewed, said that you know, was asked what he wanted to do when he grew up, and he wanted to be a math professor at Cambridge. And then having succeeded at that at a relatively young age, uh, and was, you were there for quite a while, right? And then uh, decided to forge ahead and move on to Princeton. Um, he's a very untidy mathematician, and I don't mean that in terms of personal grooming, I'll, I wouldn't know. And uh, I don't mean that in terms of papers, his papers are excellent works. Uh, but. Um, usually when we introduce a mathematician, we'll say, oh, so-and-so does uh, number theory, or so-and-so does chaos theory, or so-and-so does Hamiltonian dynamical systems, or some special single topic. Um, but Conway has been wildly creative in his career, um, including number theory and group theory. Uh, he also um, worked on a problem 
I think that was originally perhaps, I think it was first voiced by John von Neumann, in fact, uh, back in the 40s, uh, which turned into the game of life. He simplified some ideas. Um, and Conway's uh, idea about the game of life became popularized in Scientific America by uh, Martin Gardner. And uh, he also did tremendous work in game theory, and in using his work in game theory, invented something called the Surreal Numbers, which turned into a novel by Knuth, I believe. Um, he's also done work in knot theory, which will be, I think, the topic of today's talk, and coding theory, and tilings, and on and on. My, my piece of paper was too small to take them all. Uh, so it is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce John Conway. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I feel a little bit guilty at changing this title. I mean, the real thing is we accidentally got the two titles interchanged. And my original title, which was about groups, was a, a bit too hard for a general audience. But in case the, this problem, by the way, it was only for the nerds among you, OK? <laughs> if you don't, uh, OK. But I'll tell you what the answers are. And this is really to do with the talk I'm not giving. <laughs> oh, well, actually, it's not to do with the talk I'm not giving, because, of course, there are many talks I'm not giving tonight. <laughs> but it's to do with one of them. <laughs> um, uh, so the answers, um, well, um, seven, no, not 75. What, what, what's the next one? I see, 56 and 375, and let me ask why. <laughs> well, uh, let me go back to this original little table here. Can I get it all on, yes. Um, this is term number one, this is number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, and perhaps I'll just say, well, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> uh, anyway, there are precisely, you know, just as quicker, <laughs> just seven groups of order 375. So those of you who are nerdy enough to know what a group is in mathematics will probably be able to guess what the rule is from that. I mean, uh, and 375 is the smallest number for which there are seven groups. Anyway, so that's a very interesting sequence and so on, but a little bit uh, too tough for all of us. The problem I'm going to consider today is um, what knots are all about, if I can find the string in my jacket find the correct pocket, the correct string. OK. Um, so what is it that makes this thing not undoable? Well, actually, it is undoable. Look, I'm just going to undo it. <laughs> uh, um, we need some precise statements. Uh, well, if I were to um, sort of insist, if I was to fasten one end of this rope to one wall and another end to another wall, then this thing in the middle wouldn't be undoable. Of course, it'd be hard for me to do that because the walls are rather far apart and the string is pretty short. But, but let's be mathematicians and suppose that the string is uh, infinitely stretchable and very thin. Um, well, you know, what people normally say is, uh, they normally define what equivalent means for knots by saying that if you can move the string around continuously so that it never crosses itself and at the end of the move you've got to another arrangement, then you know, that arrangement was equivalent to where you started. It's, that's actually a wrong definition. Let me just show you why. Um, uh, mathematicians, by the way, usually prefer to join the ends together rather than to put, join the ends to the wall. It doesn't make much difference. So there's our first, there's our knot. Now, I'm going to continuously move that. It's a piece of string, and in mathematics, string is a 
continuous curve, point two, uh, there's some real variable. Here's about uh, halfway around, is 0.5, and then we eventually get to 0.9 and 1, <laughs> and f of 1 is the same as f of 0. So, in other words, we've taken the unit interval, the interval of all numbers between 0 and 1 inclusive, identified the ends, but we're not allowing any other crossing. And then we're going to continuously move that. Well, look, let me just show you how to do it. We're going to continuously move it, and at no time will the string ever cross itself. And this, it's going to be undone. And this is mathematical string, of course. I've got rather thick pens here, but that shouldn't deceive you. It's really supposed to be infinitely thin string. Ah, oh, there we are. I mean, I, I mean, just at this point, you might have heard a little sort of pfft noise <laughs> as something happened. Uh, but th what happened is I just pulled it tighter and tighter. Um, and, you know, th here, the parameter was 0.47 here and 0.49 here, and it was 0.48 somewhere in between, you know. And, uh, and most of the values of the parameter uh, far away from that thing. And, um, you know, as I pull it tighter, less and less of the range is near the knot. And so no two points of the knot ever coincide. So we can't use that definition of what it means to be knotted. Uh, there are several ways of getting over it. One is to insist that we don't actually do it with infinitely thin string. That at all times the string is a sort of topologically cylindrical thing or, you know, solid rubber tube, <laughs> it can get arbitrarily thin, but not infinitely thin. <laughs> um, that's one possibility. Another is to use the, uh, the notion of moving the string. So uh, that may be more clearly visible if I use these jump ropes as my string, or one of them. There we are. What can, oh, this is good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so you see there is an unnecessary crossing. I can just do that. <laughs> um, here's another one. inside my pocket. Oh, it's come back again. Let's put it up here. Um, third possibility, it's a good idea to have a third piece of string. There are three crossings, um, but I can take hold of this string and push it across here, and then those three crossings are arranged in a different way. Um, so there are some little moves I can do to change the uh, sort of apparent shape of a knot, but they don't change the real shape. Let me just draw them all out for you. That's number one. And they're usually called the Reidemeister moves, because it was Reidemeister who first proved the little theorem that they're all the ones you need. Here's number two. And here's number three. Um, the important point is that one of the strings in number three is entirely above the other two. And then it can be pulled. Let me just hint at that. It can be pulled uh, downwards across that other crossing there, after which it will look vaguely like that. 
And it's sort of fairly obvious that if you do, you know, if some part of your knot diagram, the picture of the knot, looks like one of these things at the top, um, you can replace it by the corresponding, just that part, by the corresponding thing at the bottom without uh, changing the knot. Or you can do it in the reverse direction, if you like. Uh, what's not quite so obvious is that that's all you ever need to do. That if you have a really complicated knot, you never need to do any more kinds of move than that, than those. Um, you see, for instance, if you have, uh, well, let me just give a little sample. Um, you might uh, want to do this. I mean, here's a knot, and here's a... Uh, well, I'm just going to suggest, roughly, a knot here. Ah, curses. Ah. OK, I'll, I'll do a bit better than just suggesting that. I might want to do that, this, which is like move number two, but there's a more complicated thing on one of the knots. Well, that's fine. I can first pull this string until it goes over there using move number two. And then I can pull this string so that it goes over this crossing using move number three, and so on. And a whole succe a succession of moves numbers one, two, and three will eventually achieve that more complicated move. OK, so, so we face our problem then. Um, is the trefoil knot that I just wrote there really knotted? So I want to give you a scenario, a sort of little picture. Um, I'm going to make one of these moves now. I'm going to pull that piece of string underneath there. Okay. So there was a move number two. And then I'm going to pull this piece of string underneath here. So what's it going to do? It's going to go like that. So uh, sorry, that I should really draw the hints in some other color. Um, but here we are. That, so there's another move, number two. And then. Here's another one, and another one, and another one. <laughs> and... <laughs> OK. And um, so this is a whole sequence of moves, numbers one, two, and three, and so on. And um, it eventually gets up to this situation where there are more than 10 to the 10 crossings in there, say. <laughs> OK? Um, and then I notice that there's a way of taking it apart. So I start taking it apart a bit more. And then eventually, perhaps, it comes out looking like this, which is very similar to the way, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> which is very similar to the way it started. But now I can um, do a move number two here. And then I can do a move number one here. And then it's unknotted. Now, the question is, can you see anything wrong with that scenario? <laughs> I mean, can you disprove it? Can you show that that will never happen? Um, well, certainly all of human experience, really, isn't good enough to show that because nobody has ever tried to undo this very simple knot by first taking it up to more than 10 to the 10 crossings and then seeing if by some chance you can undo it some other way. So the fact that we have sort of learned in our lifetimes that knots like that can't be undone doesn't actually prove they can't be undone. That's the only point I'm trying to make. <laughs> it just proves that uh, we didn't go far enough. <laughs> of course, there may not be a way <laughs> anyway, but we've got to sort of consider. Well, there's an easy way to show that knots do exist. 
and uh, it uses what I call numberings, only that's spelt in a special way. Um, numberings. Well, numberings of knots. Okay. Um, so what a, what a conumbering is, is this. To, to the diagram of a knot, to each sort of visible piece of a string, you assign a number, which never changes as you go along the string, unless the string goes under some, something else. So, um, uh, so here, this string at the left started off being labeled A, or numbered A, but then when it went under this string labeled B, it was allowed to come out with a different number. But it's not just totally free. The rule is that that is part of a numbering. numbering just if A, B, and C are in arithmetic progression. Well, that's a long phrase. Oh. Um, but what it really means is that B minus A is equal to C minus B. And, and the way I, the reason I write it like that is because B minus A is the amount you have to go up from, to get from A to B. So the amount you have to get, go up to go from A to B is exactly the same as the amount by which you have to go up to get from B to C. And whenever I've checked that, I put a little green spot on the appropriate place of the knot. So let me, um, let me just sort of illustrate by doing a bit of a numbering and then... Um, Actually, you will have to help me a little bit. Um, I, I mean, here's my knot. Sorry, I, I sort of forgot to join the ends together there, but here they are. And now um, I'm going to sort of try and get roughly the most general numbering I can here. <laughs> um, well, the first thing is, if you have a numbering, and you increase all the numbers by one, say, it's still a numbering. <laughs> or in fact, if you increase or decrease them by any fixed amount, because it still preserves that property. So we might as well suppose that this little piece of string is, is labeled zero. It won't hurt us to do that. And then uh, I'm just wondering what this piece of string is named. Well, suppose it happens to be 10, <laughs> OK? So here it is, naught, 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 and then this piece is labeled 10. Then this piece will be labeled 20, OK? Because what I'll do is I'll say 0, 10, and 20. Good, good children, very good indeed. Um, and, um, and then after we've sort of verified this, I'll put the green spot on there. But isn't it obvious that if you multiply or divide all the numbers by 10, or any other number <laughs> that you can divide by anyway, a numbering stays a numbering. So I can say, well, without, without loss of generality, this next one is going to be numbered 1. And then this piece is numbered, well, 0, 1, come on, 2. two. Good, good. And so now I've just checked the condition at that crossing. Now uh, I'm coming up here, 1, 2, 3. You're a really very, very bright audience. Um, and now, two, three, four. Oh, there's a bit of a problem here. Because you remember I said that the number had to say the same all the way along the string. And one isn't equal to four. <sighs> well, that's a bit sad. But we mathematicians have special powers to allow us to overcome things like that. I mean, one isn't equal to four unless a mathematician says it is, and then it is. Um, so one is actually equal to four. We call that one 
being congruent to 4 mod 3. Two numbers are said to be, well, let's just call them equal mod 3 if their difference is a multiple of 3. So, so 1 is equal to 4. Good, so this is a numbering. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I've got to check the condition here, but fortunately, uh, 3 is equal to 0. So that's fine, too. So this is a numbering modulo 3. OK, fine. Um, so there are such things. But what on earth is the point, you ask, of numberings? Well, that was, a, as uh, I would have expected from you, that's a very, very good question. Um, well, the answer is, uh, there's a lovely little theorem. Uh, it says the number of numberings, oh, sorry. Ah, can't spell off. <laughs> The number of numberings, and even these not quite correct numberings, so let me say modulo any number, never <laughs> changes. Actually, I should find a way of um, a word beginning change, meaning change that begins with an N, so that I can make it begin with a K, but anyway. Um, that's a lovely little theorem. And what do I mean? Well, I mean, as you make um, the moves, the so-called Reidemeister moves, R1 to R3. Um, so let's, let's just prove that, because it's fantastically easy to prove. Um, uh, you see, here's move number one. Um, now, this will be labeled A, 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 A. Ah, and now we have a problem. A, A, no, it's not B. <laughs> it's A. Because how much do you have to go up to get from A to A? Zero. So you have to go up from A by zero to A again. So the wonderful thing is, if you are entitled to put that little green spot there, then it must be the case that when this string began and when it ends, it had the same number as it. And in that circumstance, you can just sort of copy it onto this simpler diagram. I mean, uh, let, let's sort of understand. There's more not down here, and that may have Bs and Cs and Ds in it. I'm trying to make it look exactly the same, but <laughs> I didn't quite succeed. But anyway, um, uh, you know, we, we copy the, the numbering elsewhere exactly as it was, but do that. Um, and so, you know, if you have a numbering of this more complicated figure, it must come from or be associated with a numbering of this simpler figure. That wouldn't have been the case if this could have been B. OK? Let's, let's do another one. I have a feeling that this is going to be much too hard for you. OK. This is labeled A all over the place without loss of generality because that's, I'm letting A be its label. And then here's B. Ooh, now what happens? B, A. That's really awful. Well, I'll tell you. The answer is twice B minus A. Because to get from B to A, you have to add A minus B. No? Oh, the answer isn't what I said. Um, <laughs> OK. Let's, let's do it a different way. I, um, here, I'll, I'll color this bottom one A because that's what I thought I'd done on the top one, B. Now, A, B, twice B minus A. You can call it C if you like, <laughs> but C had better be twice B minus A. It can't be anything else. Um, because to get from A to B, you have to add B minus A. So we have to add B minus A again. And what happens if you add B minus A to B? Well, you get twice B minus A. OK. Now here's a hard one. Um, Twice B minus A, B, well, it goes back to A again. Because twice B minus twice B minus A, 
is A. I mean, if something is an arithmetic progression read one way around, it's an arithmetic progression labeled the other way around. So again, we have this nice property that the string that went under here and therefore was allowed to change its name, in fact, it had to change its name, when it emerges again, it, it happens that it's got exactly the same name as when it left us. Um, and so I can copy this labeling too. And conversely, if I have a labeling here and I push the A string under the B string to get this picture up at the top, then the number that goes at the top is determined. It must be twice B minus A. It can't be anything else. So each numbering of the thing at the bottom corresponds to just one numbering of the thing at the top. And now let's do the last one, which is uh, unbelievably hard and also rather boring. So I'll do it quickly. Um, whoops, whoops, whoops. There's the left-hand picture. And here's the right-hand picture. And now I'm going to start with A, B, and C on those strings. And I'm going to try and start these the same way, because I'm going to employ the same basic mechanism. And then this B has to go all the way across, because that string never went um, under anything. This is A until it gets to this crossing, when it has to be twice B minus A. <laughs> OK? And it's still twice B minus A when it comes out, because it didn't go under again. And then here's this C. Oh, my. What goes under there? Well, it must be twice, twice B minus A minus C. Oh, my God. And what's this thing? This is twice B minus twice, twice B minus A minus C. It's never been this complicated in its life before for me. Anyway, let's carry on. This number has to be twice B minus C. And I've made, oh, I should have been putting my dots on the crossing. I won't bother to make them green. This one has to be twice A minus twice B minus C. And I've done that one. And this one has to be twice B minus A. And I've done that one. And now we just look at these and we see that, well, that number is equal to that number and that to that and that to that. What I'm checking is that when they emerge, they're the same on each side. Well, no big surprise, because I made, made it like that for those three. But look, this number is twice B minus A, and so is this one. This number is B, and so is this one. And this number is twice A minus twice B minus C, and this one is this much more complicated thing. What is it? It's twice B minus four times B plus twice A minus C, if I've got it right. No, it's plus C. And that's what that is, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we are competent enough at our algebra, we can do that. So I've proved this theorem that when you make uh, th By the way, that's all you need to know. That whenever you make one of these changes, or a succession of them, in fact, the number of numberings never changes. And now let's go back to this old picture here and see what's wrong with it. Well. What's the number of numberings of this thing at the end, modulo 3? Well, here, here they are. I can label it. Because it never goes under, it's got to be labeled with the same number all around. <laughs> and it could be labeled with 1. It could also be labeled with 2. But there are no other numbers mod 3. <laughs> so uh, this thing has just three numberings. Uh, I'll put it up in a moment. Mod 3. OK. I'm sorry, I'm not writing very legibly. <laughs> but there's the proof. But now, this thing has, I'll show you, at least four. Why is that? Well, I could number it all zero everywhere. And that still works, because zero, zero, zero is legal. And then I could also label it one everywhere, or two everywhere. So fine, I found three numberings of it. But the other clever thing I could do is number it 
zero here, one here, and two here. And then zero, one, two is, is a legal thing, and one, two, zero is legal too, because it's the same as one, two, three. <laughs> and uh, what's this other one? One, zero, two is legal, because it's the same as one, zero, negative one. <laughs> so this thing has four. Well, at least four. So it's not possible for this scenario here to happen, because this had at least four different numberings, mod three. So this has at least four. It has exactly the same number, whatever that is. So this has at least four. So this has at least four. So, and it carries on like this. This has at least four numberings. This has at least, oh, and then if this were a true diagram, we'd conclude that this has at least four numberings, mod three. So it must be telling a lie. Uh, I'll show you that uh, I can tell lies too. Um, here's um, a piece of string. Uh, you can't see very well. Let me perhaps go over here. Fortunately, really, you can't see very well. Um, I'm going to promise you I'm never going to leave go of the ends of this. And so I won't be able, as we've just proved, to do that, which I just did. I didn't leave go of the ends. And uh, there I succeeded in tying a knot. Well, you can now prove I'm a liar. If I'd done this before and you told me I lied, you would have had my lawyer on you. But uh, now, unfortunately, I've armed you against that. OK. Um, so uh, there's a proof that there are some knots. Um, in particular, it proves that this very simplest knot, called the overhand knot or the trefoil knot, really is a knot. Um, and the reason is that it has a non-constant numbering mod 3. Now, this one has a non-constant numbering mod 5. Uh, and so it's a knot as well. <laughs> but rather fortunately, we can get a bit more out of it. This is called the figure 8 knot, by the way. Uh, but we can get a bit more out of the argument because this doesn't have a non-constant numbering mod 3. <laughs> so it can't be the same as the trefoil knot. <laughs> and incidentally, the trefoil knot doesn't have a non-constant numbering mod 5. So what actually happens is we found a kind of invariant here. Um, yeah, let's call a number sort of good for a knot <laughs> if that knot has an, a numbering modulo, uh, the good number, that, uh, that isn't just constant, isn't the same number everywhere. And um, so it happens, you know, a good number for this is 5. A good number for the trefoil is 3. There's another knot that I can show you, this, this knot called the tweeny knot, which puts an extra twist in there. Here it is. Oh, no, I didn't put quite enough twist in. Oops. Um, yeah, this is the tweeny. And for it, the magic number is 7. Um, and so this knot is different. However, uh, this magic number isn't good enough <laughs> to tell you exactly which knots are which. Here's the knot called the quinquefoil. Um, and for it, the magic number is 5, just the same as it was for the figure 8 knot, which I'll put back on here. Um, so these both have the same magic number. So the magic number doesn't prove they're different, but they are different. <laughs> And the subject of knot theory for a very long time was concerned with finding invariants like this magic number that would prove one knot different from another. And now knot theorists have got very good at that, and somehow they've got less interested too. <laughs> uh, it's become so easy. It used to be very hard to find invariants in knot theory, but now it's got easy. Well, now I want to do something else. Actually, it's not that I want to do something else. It's that I want you to do something else. So um, let me try and tell you what it is. I'm going to introduce the subject of tangles. So here is a tangle. Uh, a tangle is a piece of knottiness with four ends coming out in roughly those four compass directions, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. Uh, 
And usually, I'll just draw it like that and call it the tangle T. I mean, if you like, you can sort of suppose that this thing here is a ball that I've sort of put around the tangle so that you can't see exactly what, which particular one it is. Um, and now what I want to do is introduce this mysterious arithmetic of tangles. So here it is. First of all, here is the tangle I call zero. OK, audience, zero, zero, audience. OK, you're well acquainted now. Um, uh, now, here are the rules. Well, here is the rule for adding one to a tangle. So this tangle is called t plus one. Uh, let me draw t down here. And let's think of the move by which you get from t to t plus 1. I'm going to call that move twist, twist them up. OK? Um, and it takes t to t plus 1. But now I'm going to introduce yet another interesting tangle. And this is got from the tangle t. I mean, let's imagine that four people are holding the ends of the string, as they will be soon, um, then this is, is the tangle minus 1 over t. Uh, those four people all move one place clockwise. <laughs> then, if they like, they can pull it tight. Uh, and this is called turn them round. OK. So now I want four volunteers to come and do some of this. Come on. Conscripts will do if I don't find volunteers. Volunteer, let's have a big hand. OK. Four volunteers. All right. Ladies seem to be very shy today, but uh, never mind. We'll do with that. OK, so here we are. Grab. Grab. OK, so oh, let's move over here a bit so we can see. Uh, I'm sorry, now I've got to teach you folks how to, um, yeah, how to do things. Um, so th the first thing is how to display. OK, so what you do is the two people in the front, who won't always be you two, but they are right now, so you, you'd lot better listen, should sort of lower the hand that's holding the string, and the two people at the back should raise it. OK. Now, they've learned that, apparently, although we'll see later. Now I've got to train you. When they succeed in doing that successfully, and not before, you applaud them. Well, they just did do it successfully, so let's... OK, oh, no, no, no. It wasn't that hard. It didn't, it didn't deserve that much applause, OK? So let's just have... Well, let's put it down again now. Um, let's just have, say, two claps, or if you think they did a spectacularly good job, Three. OK. Display. <laughs> Wonderful. Absolutely marvelous. OK, now let, uh, let's teach him to uh, twist them up, OK? So um, when I say twist them up, the person here, who won't always be you, but is at the moment, should go over the person in front of him or her or whatever. You should basically interchange places, but the one in this corner should go, in your corner, should go over. OK. Twist them up. Ah, uh, ah, uh, they didn't actually display. Display. <laughs> uh, they eventually got it right. <laughs> All right. Now we need an arithmetician. Um, is there an arithmetician in the house? That is absolutely disgraceful. <laughs> that really is. Um, well, come on, you just have to appoint an arithmetician. You. Come on. <laughs> Hooray. Um, so, where are we now? Ar arithmetician, please. Where are we? No, no, no. We started at what? Do you remember? Oh, you don't remember anything, do you? 
we started there. Oh, now we're at. And we did that. T plus one. Yeah, and what was T? Oh yeah, well there wasn't one. Yes, there was, it was zero. zero. Come on, the arithmetician. Okay. So, so what's now, the answer? So now we're at one. Hooray! Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> OK. So here we are, zero to one. Now you've got to pay a lot of attention. It's your job now. You better watch her because, OK. Twist them up. <laughs> oh, no. Come on. Let's, let's start again. <laughs> OK, arithmetician, pause until, OK. <laughs> Display where it's zero. OK, good. <laughs> Twist them up. Right, now, it's only the person here. I, I mean, you, you have a slight excuse because you were the person in the operating chair before, but you're not anymore. OK. Tw and we are now at one. OK, twist them up. Hooray. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, two. Twist them up again. And again. Right, where are we? We're at, we ought to be at four, yeah. OK. Now, turn them round. You all walk. No, 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 no. You, you don't know which clockwise is. You all walk one place clockwise, as seen from somebody who should be hanging up the roof there, but he seems to have gone away. OK, so one place clockwise. Now, where are we, folks? No, negative one fourth. I'm afraid there was a minus sign in there. OK. Good. Uh, twist them up. Where are we? Three quarters, yeah. That's good. Twist them up. I think we haven't got a very professional arithmetician here. <laughs> Seven quarters. Um, turn them round. M minus four sevenths. Twist them up. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> okay. Three sevenths. Good. Um, well, how about coming down here in the back then? Twist them up again. Ten sevenths. Hey, come on, you should be doing this. Um, what should we do now? Turn them around. Minus seven tenths, good. Twist them up. Good, twist them up again. Good, twist them up again. Good, turn them round. Minus ten twenty thirds, twist them up. <laughs> <laughs> And twist them up again. Great. Now. Yeah. No, no, no. You, it was twist them up, not that. Scrub that out. Yeah. I hope they're not doing anything naughty. Sorry. It's a big, uh, important deal here. Right, that's that. <clears throat> and this is this. This will conceal this tangle from prying eyes. Delightful. Uh, okay, ladies and gents, I want you to um, get back to zero. I'm not quite sure exactly whether I'm addressing the audience or the players or the arithmetician or whatever. Uh, you're only allowed to do the two moves. You know, I think I'm going to sit down and watch this. <laughs> um, you're only allowed to the, do the two moves we've been doing. In particular, you can't twist them down. So you either twist them up or you turn them around and you've got to get back to zero. Well, what are you going to do first? 
If you twist up, what will it get to? You're a lot of dummies. <laughs> yeah, 59 over something. You don't want to twist up, do you? So what do you want to do? Come on, children. Turn them around. OK, arithmetician, take note. Audience, three, two, one, shout. Three, two, one. Oh. <laughs> What did you hear? OK, do it. <laughs> Arithmetician. <laughs> <laughs> That's 36 on the bottom there. What are you going to do, folks? OK, where are we? Well, that doesn't seem to have been a good move. But don't undo it, you're not allowed to. Okay. Put the right sign on, OK. <laughs> Did they twist it up, then? Yeah. yeah, OK. You've got to keep a note that they're doing what you tell them to do. You have to push the paper up now. <laughs> Never mind, I did it. OK, come on, they did it, yeah. No, they no, they didn't do that.
Uh, oh, yes, okay. Go ahead. I'm pushing the paper up. No, they, they actually got to zero when, when they think about it. OK, so the trouble is, I have a horrible feeling that, <laughs> that we may have lost step. So whether we have any applause or not depends. Well, of course, it's actually rather hard to get this plastic bag off here. It's not funny, this thing is... So, phew, they didn't make any mistakes. Well, thanks, Audrey. OK, so now let's keep them for a little bit. Um, these folks don't mind. Um, turn them around. Now we turn them around now. Infinity. <laughs> OK. Um, so let's see what happens when we add one. Twist them up, please. <laughs> We're still there at infinity, you see, isn't that now? <laughs> OK, well, let's have a big hand for our four volunteers. Thank you, ladies and gents. Um, and our big, uh, our great arithmetician who managed, with some prompting, to get the arithmetic right every now and then. OK. Um, so, that's quite an interesting phenomenon, it actually works. Of course, just verifying that it worked in one instance doesn't really prove that what's true, which is that this funny kind of arithmetic is consistent. In other words, it is possible to label certain tangles with numbers in such a way that if you add one twist at the right-hand side, in that particular sense, it adds one to the number. And if you turn them around, it negatively inverts the number. Um, that's a very nice theorem. Um, it's fairly easy to show, to see how it's related. You see, here's the tangle, for instance, um, that we would call one third. OK? And it turns out that what that means is this. I mean, let me come in with zero at, at the left here and now 1 at the right, then 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, uh, 2, 3, 4. So what actually happens is, if you go in that direction, you add 1, okay? 
zero goes to one and three goes to four. And if you go in that direction, you add three. And the ratio here, <laughs> it, it, I mean, this number that you attach to the tangle is just the ratio of the two amounts by which the numbering increases. And that shows you, uh, uh, it's fairly easy to show you that if you add one, let me just try adding one to that. Okay, this is four, 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 four. Here's one. One goes under four and reemerges as seven. And now, you see, I'm to go in that direction adds four, and to go in that direction adds three, and so the ratio is four thirds, <laughs> okay? It's fairly easy to do the little, there's one other calculation of this type you have to do, namely for the turn them around move, but it's really rather easy to see that if, if the ratio of the numbers in the numbering idea, <laughs> the numbers by which you have to increase going horizontally and vertically, uh, is attached to the tangle, then the two tangles you get by twisting it up or turning it round have the appropriate numbers, t plus 1 and um, minus 1 over t. So that sort of is all that's needed, really, or almost all that's needed to prove that it's consistent <laughs> and, and it works. Um, and then um, you get the ability to name a whole lot of knots. I mean, one knot that I could name is... The knot I'll call one third. A tangle, remember, is different to a knot. Here's a tangle, here's a knot. So this is the knot I call one third, but just for safety's sake, I, I put that in square brackets. Okay? Um, but now we can do a little bit more. Um, we can have what I call a bangle of tangles. I mean, we can have a tangle here that's A over B, and I'll just write the name A over B inside, and then another tangle, C over D, and then another tangle, E over F, and then we can put the whole thing, so to speak, around our wrist. Um, and that's the bangle, um, A over B, some kind of plus sign. C over D, E over F. And it's a good idea to put sort of serifs on that plus sign or something, just to make sure that we don't just mean ordinary addition. Um, and um, what happens is that this tangle arithmetic I was just teaching you um, extends to a kind of arithmetic of knots. Uh, you see, it doesn't make any difference if I... Um, add 1 to A over B and subtract 1 from C over D. It's the same knot. Let me illustrate why. Uh, here is A over B, and there is A over B plus 1. Okay? I added a crossing. And now here is C over D, and, well, I could add the crossing on the other side if I like. This is minus 1 plus C over D. <laughs> But you can see that those two, the one and the minus one, just cancel each other out. So it turns out that what happens is the name like this that you assign to a bangle isn't quite unique. Um, if you add some integers to the three fractions involved, then it still will represent the same tangle, provided those integers add up to zero. For instance, after I've subtracted one from C over D here, I might subtract two more and then add two to E over F. So altogether, I added one to A over B, I subtracted three from C over D, and I added two to E over F. But since the, the integers I've added add up to zero, <laughs> it, uh, it, that doesn't affect the knot. And then there's a nice theorem, which was a conjecture I made, oh my God, such a long time ago, 35 or 40 years ago now, that, um, that this is essentially all. That if two bangles are really the same knot, then it's because their names can be converted one into the other, just in this manner. <laughs> okay. There's something else you can do. I mean, the bangle is like this around your wrist. It can be rotated around the wrist so that 
a over b plus c over d plus e over f is the same as c over d plus e over f plus a over b. Or you could take it right off your wrist and put it on the other way around, <laughs> which would put the things in the other order. But apart from trivial things like that, um, two bangles are the same knot, if and only if them, they more or less look the same. <laughs> and then this generalizes still further to a class of knots I call the arithmetical knots, um, where you can start adding tangles. I mean, here I've just added tangles horizontally. But now you can add tangles vertically as well, <laughs> with a different kind of plus sign. And uh, you can totally classify the collection of knots that happen like that. Perhaps I should have said something about knots. The um, problem of classifying knots was a very hard one. That's just the problem. You know, I give you two pieces of string, and I ask you, are they knotted in the same way? It was a very hard one that, for a long time, in fact, when I started in the game, was thought was going to be uh, impossible to solve. We thought that that was an, likely to be an undecidable problem. And then we got a big shock because a guy called Wolfgang Hacken published a paper in which he showed that you could tell whether a piece of string was knotted or not. And that's the simplest case of that problem. <laughs> and it, Hacken's paper was very long, messy, complicated, but it was clearly right. Unlike the later thing that he collaborated on when he proved the four color theorem with Kenneth Apple. Uh, he's a good mathematician. He solved two very good problems. Um, but the solution of the four color problem, it wasn't clear that the solution was right for a very long time, although it turned out to be. Um, and then, um, then the smart money changed its mind and thought, well, probably, since we can tell whether a knot is equivalent to the unknot, in other words, whether it's knotted, probably we can tell whether two knots are equivalent. And that was eventually proved to be the case. And now it's not very hard, mathematically, to distinguish knots. Um, but the method is really rather peculiar. Uh, and basically, it demands a computer. <laughs> and it's, uh, the problem that concerns me is a much more interesting one, uh, but less clearly defined. How can you sort of come to appreciate the distinctions between knots in general. <laughs> you know, I mean, you see, the existing thing has an algorithm. And you apply that algorithm, and it's quite a complicated algorithm. And if it says yes, then they're equivalent. And if it says no, they're not equivalent. And you haven't learned anything. You, know, you can put another pair of knots into the machine, and it'll tell you. But you haven't really learned anything. Whereas with this kind of classification here, I know straight away if a knot does look like this, I know which other forms like this it's equal to without any use of a computer. Um, and so I've just been gently pushing in this direction. Th this class of algebraic knots includes nearly all the knots of up to 10 crossings, which gets it to rather more than 1,000 knots of that range it handles. It includes infinitely many knots, but you know, nearly all of the ones in the old knot tables. Uh, you can go a little bit further with a more complicated description. <laughs> and then a bit further still with a more complicated one again. And I think that's the answer to knot theory, that there's no complete way of sort of comprehending what knots are like. But there's an incomplete way that does pretty well. And there's another incomplete way that does better, but harder to understand. And there's one that still does better, but still harder to understand. And OK. I'm allowed to stop, aren't I? Yes. OK, I'll stop. <laughs>
Um, so uh, the topologists call that a one-dimensional sphere because <laughs> it's the dimension of the thing itself, not of the area it outlines. And now here is a no-dimensional sphere. Okay? I mean, you see, here's its center. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, think of it in a one-dimensional space. A no-dimensional sphere is the set of points in a one-dimensional space that are a given distance from the center. And there are two of them. <laughs> okay. So there's a no-dimensional sphere. And now here's a no-dimensional sphere that's linked to a one-dimensional sphere in two dimensions. Okay. I can't, um, I mean, here are these two points here. I can't bring them together because this one-dimensional one is separating them. So that's rather like the picture that you know of two rings that are linked in three dimensions. These are two one-dimensional spheres in three dimensions. Well, what that suggests is actually what's true. The minimal dimension in which you can not, or sorry, link things, uh, uh, say the minimal dimension in which you can link two spheres is the sum of their dimensions plus one. Okay, so these are two ones, so you need the dimension to be strictly greater than their sum, so they can be linked in three dimensions. Here's a zero and a one, they can be linked in two dimensions. Two, uh, two zeros can actually be linked in a one-dimensional space. Oh, sorry, two zeros can be linked <laughs> in a one-dimensional space. Um, that's very nice. Uh, let me show you that an ordinary knot, that's a knot in a one-dimensional sphere, can be untied in, um, in four dimensions. So, well, uh, let me just, first of all, show you that, do you remember the kind of knot uh, of link that I just had of a one-dimensional sphere? Sorry. You're going to have to pretend that's a one piece of a one-dimensional sphere and you can't see all of it. Um, now what I'm going to show you is that this one-dimensional sphere and this zero-dimensional sphere... Oh, sorry, that's not very good. Uh, they're too shiny. Okay. This uh, one-dimensional sphere and zero-dimensional sphere can, they're not linked in three dimensions. Well, it's very, very easy to show that. It, ju it just looks so stupid. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lift this one-dimensional sphere out of two-dimensional space for a time, okay? And then I'm going to push this through to meet its friend, and there we are. <laughs> okay? So I unlinked them. Or indeed, if you want to make clear, absolutely clear that I linked, I'll pull them both outside. Well, now, suppose I have a knot or a link in, yes, let, let's just link two loops of string here. So I'm going to tie this into a loop. And you see, it's linked to this one that I'm holding in my hand. OK. But now I'm going to undo that in four dimensions. Just watch it, very easy. I'm going to lift a little bit of this out of three-dimensional space. Now it looks like that. <laughs> okay. You see, this just left the space and went off and came down again. And now I've done that, and it's really rather hard to hold this. I can just pull this off through the hole, just the way I did with those, and then drop this back into the space again. And there we are. <laughs> um, so any, any ordinary knot in a circle, or in several circles, can be undone in four dimensions. But instead, you start tying spheres in knots, in, uh, which is really rather nice. <laughs> Someone else? Yep. This is, is this is the garden hose problem, is it? I mean, um, at the end of the winter, my garden hose is just as knotted as yours, or in fact, probably more so, since as you were so unkind to say, Sam, I'm very untidy. Um, 
but um, uh, no, not when it gets really complicated. But what I can do is this. You can show me a knot that isn't as complicated as the kind we, we find in our garden hoses. And um, I can say, aha, you know, that's 13 seventeenths. <laughs> and then, you know, if I just remember that little sort of code, and we meet again a week later, and you want to know exactly what that knot was looked like, well, I could build 13 seventeenths for you and show you what it's like. So in other words, this procedure has educated my visual memory to some extent. What you see as a tangle which you can't really analyze, <laughs> you know, I can actually recognize as one of my friends. And, and that's roughly the way I want to learn everything. I want to become familiar with everything in the world. So, you know, I like knowing the names of all the stars in the sky, which I once learned. Um, I like knowing which knots are which. <laughs> like knowing everything else. And the method is to sort of find clever ways to name them that, you know, correspond to their natural structures and then work there. And that's roughly the way I've always worked doing mathematics. I just sort of look at the mathematical objects around, try and find a naming system that suits them. And in this case, you see how well that set of fractional names suited tangles. Uh, by the way, it wasn't obvious that tangles were the correct thing to look at. You see, you might have thought knots were the correct thing to look at. But no, tangles are easier than knots because the, the kind of tangles I was just showing you correspond one for one to, to numbers. Really lovely. <laughs> so, you know, the, the art, I think, of being successful in this kind of thing is to find correspondences like that, which amount to sort of giving you an encyclopedia of whatever kind of object it is you're studying. And then, you know, you learn that. Okay. <laughs>